You where you're in LA, I assume, huh? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, how long you been in Seattle? I've been here since uh, 1990. 1990. Yeah. And what drove you up there? Kind of similarities of uh, old school San Francisco. No, my ex-wife was from here, and we had our first kid, who's now in LA. Um, and she thought it would be a good place to, you know, raise a family and and that kind of thing. So it was kind of actually it was like four days after the 1989 earthquake. Oh yeah, came up here, um, and we were already packed to go when that earthquake happened. But um, you know, it's funny because I I would lived in New York for quite a while, and. I just kept waiting for the earthquake to happen in California while I was in New York so I could go back to, you know, um, California. Cheap living once the quake hits. <laughs> you know, so, but everywhere I go, I mean, I was in the L.A. earthquake as well. I was in the, the big one and the San Francisco one. Then uh, I moved up here and there was one not long ago. After I moved up here, there was one that happened not too long after it. But yeah, so much for like waiting for earthquakes to happen. <laughs> ah, man, I'll never forget that 89 one. You know, I'm from uh, the Bay Area and it was it was insane. Actually, that whole Bay Bridge collapsing and the, the marina on fire. It's just exactly uh, what you would see in a movie. Yeah. Where were you in the Bay Area? San Francisco. Um uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, I was in the Bay during that. I I didn't see the uh, didn't get the L.A. one, the '92 one, but that '89 one. I just sat down to watch the World Series, right? And bam, crazy. Yeah, I forgot about that. The World Series was happening. That must have been scary being in 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 what it was a Candlestick Park still. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, man, it's uh, it's an honor to talk to you because uh, I'm a, a really good friends with uh, Greg Raleigh, and I'm absolutely a huge Santana guy. And uh -huh. and uh, I was doing an interview yesterday, and somebody said Desert Island, ten records, and that's always impossible to say. But when I really think about some of the greatest live records, it's that '68 Fillmore, and then that Roxy. Um, Bob Marley live at the Roxy in LA. Those two are so raw and incredible and capture something so dynamic. It's, it's mind boggling to me that Santana 68 Fillmore is incredible. Yeah. I'm not even sure I'm on that one. Um, that was a re-release, wasn't it? Some time ago. And I think that, I think that might've had their original drummer, um, before I had come in, but they were always, I mean, I was a fan before I was in the band. They were always incredible live. So, um, yeah, I just, I just finished that one love Bob Marley film the other night. That was really good. Oh, is it good? It's really good, man. Yeah. I gotta see that. You know, it's, uh, of course, most people know you, you played Woodstock which is the most iconic, I feel, the most iconic festival of all time. People ask me, Time Machine, where would you go? And I said, Woodstock. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, because it's a complete cultural and music game and festival game changer. You know? It's, yeah. uh, it, I mean, there's so many people that lie and said they were at Woodstock, but you can't lie and say you played Woodstock. <laughs> right i mean you just go like nah you didn't play it you know yeah right right um yeah boy that was really something it, I, I don't know how the people put up with it all i'm not great at being in big crowds like that and uh it's probably from playing so many festivals that i i have an aversion to being in a in a, a big crowd just next to a, a bunch of people but um but yeah, Woodstock, I mean, what what's amazing, I didn't realize till 30 years later that every year it came around, people were still excited about it. And it took me quite a while to also let go of the fact that every time somebody talks about me, it's that solo at Woodstock, which is like, 
practically 60 years earlier, you know what I mean? There was a point when I was doing my own records or doing other projects, and it's like nobody gave a fuck, you know? And I realized, well, that kind of sets you free, you know? Just do what you want, do it hard, and don't be upset about people just talking about Woodstock. Actually, we, you should just shut up and be grateful and say thank you and uh, get on with doing whatever whatever you want to do in life. You know, you're not going to change. You're not going to change people's minds about that. Yeah, I, I understand it because, you know, you do something your whole life and then people are like Woodstock, Woodstock, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, eight songs set in your career, um, you know, on a Saturday afternoon. But yeah. the the incredible thing about it to me is no other band had the career impact that Santana had. They're basically there unknown. Bill Graham gets him onto the bill. And yep. then, uh, you know, 45 minutes later, your complete life changes. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And he told us about that as well. I mean, he told us that you guys are going to play a festival and it's going to change your lives. And, um, and then he prepped us for it by booking us across the country that summer on um, about a half a dozen big festivals, like the Dallas Pop Festival and the Miami Pop Festival, Atlanta Pop, big festivals where, you know, there were bigger crowds than we'd ever played. And that prepared us for, um, well, somewhat prepared us for Woodstock because it, Woodstock turned into be something nobody imagined it, it it would be. I was recently there, Bill and I, Burr, um, we did the venue that's built right behind the, the famous slope. And yeah. uh, I did that too. Yeah. I did yeah. a thing there. They brought us down into the bowl and we just sat there. It was just the two of us. And you could actually, as corny as this might sound, you could actually still feel the magicness of the of those grounds you know it was something to it we're just sitting there going like this is it and it felt a lot smaller while we were there than what you you imagine you know you're right right i know i mean it's just it's so many people for me on the stage when people ask me what was it like you know um i used to i used to surf a lot so i was at the ocean a lot when i was in high school and it reminded me of just being on the beach and looking out at the horizon, except it wasn't water. It was people as far as you could see was just humanity. And, and then there was the sky. And for some reason it, you'd think you'd be scared to death, but you're really high up and there's a, a good distance between the crowd and you, because it's a whole area for photographers, which was quite large. And so it was just like, being at the beach you know you didn't really pick out individuals in the crowd and also santana was a band that played to each other uh and we weren't that kind of like front-facing entertainment type of band um we thought of ourselves as musicians and we 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 really played to each other tried to get each other off on, on that sort of situation i'll tell you you know the key thing to that show really is of course Santana's going at it, but the rhythm section, you know, of you and Dave Brown uh, was just so locked and such, such a fierce groove. When you first start playing drums, when do you kind of get into the Latin feels like who were your guys? Because this is a, a totally different feel than just say, you know, four on the floor rock and roll, you know? Yeah. Well, the truth is I really never played Latin music. So I aspired to be like more of a jazz drummer, to tell you the truth. But I, I was very much into R&B, so I, I was very aware of the groove. I played rock and roll. I came up when the Beatles came up and all the San Francisco bands. But um, but I kind of aspired to play, be a jazz drummer. I had played, I had practiced out of one book about Latin rhythms but I never played with any anybody. And so the truth is, I didn't play really Latin when I joined Santana. 
all the Latin stuff, I played it like a jazz drummer. I swang it like a ding, 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 you know, but it fit. It just happened to work. It worked and it was natural for me. So I didn't sound like a, like an outsider. Uh, so that's the thing where everybody asks me, well, how'd you learn how to play Latin music? And it's like, I never really got into Latin music whatsoever until I got in Santana and they turned me on to stuff. But even then we had, you know, a great conga player and a great timbali player and they provided that that sort of thing you know yeah there weren't, de- there weren't definitely- a lot of drum sets in, Af- in in latin music either they were definitely uh firing up that flavor man those guys were killing it you know there's yeah, a absolutely. there's a classic photo that my buddy baron woolman took rest in peace of bill right behind you guys uh behind the leslie with a with a um you know cowbell and I always wondered, was that yours just laying on the ground and you didn't set it up, or was that one of the percussion guys? I'm not sure, but I know that 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 was a classic shot, man. And Baron uh, Baron had so many great shots from that day, um, but I don't know whose it was. You know, I don't even know if I some at some point I put a cowbell on my kit, but a lot of the time I didn't because I wasn't playing those Latin rhythms. You know, right. And and were you playing a what was that a vintage Ludwig back then? Well, it wasn't vintage then, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking genius, right? <laughs> I talked to Baron uh, over the years, and he told me an amazing story. And I don't know if you can remember this, but he said that he had uh, there was that long, long miles, miles long uh, line of cars to get in off the freeway. And he was like, yeah, these hippies didn't know how to read a map. I just opened a map and went two streets over and just drove straight up to the venue. (laughs) (laughs) Is that amazing or what? Yeah, that's really amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Now, After you guys played, did you guys cut out of there or did you stay? We stuck around. Um, We didn't, I didn't stay the next day, but we stuck around because we wanted to see some of the other acts and we wanted to, see uh, our buddy Sly and the Family Stone play uh, oh. playing that night. And and that was an interesting thing because Sly wouldn't go on unless they paid him cash, you know? Oh, yeah, that old one. Yeah, you know, it's that uh, that Chitlin circuit for kind of thinking. And it's so funny because here's the whole hippie love thing, and, you know, and he's, like, holding out for the cash. And I really remember that. There was another incident that was another festival years ago like uh the big philadelphia festival anyway um but i really that struck me that like, i can't believe it. this guy's holding out for the cash and everybody's here like hippie love thing but he went out and it was dark by the time they went on and they just fucking killed it it was it was i mean that was electrifying to me that was the best performance at woodstock I'd say maybe between us and them, you know. Oh yeah, and, the, yeah. I mean, Sly is Sly is a, a freak of nature, and uh, when you just think about what he put together, that band, and and just the songwriting is unreal, man. You know. Yeah. And no, the, no Prince without Sly and the Family Stone. You know. That's for sure. Sly, Sly, and. Um, and Hendrix, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, Sly was just unbelievable. We used to do gigs together in the Bay Area, and it was always like a battle of the street gangs, you know. Uh, I mean, they practiced. We rehearsed every day, you know. We were once I got in the band. I, I said this in my speech at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I soon found out this was no hippie love thing. This was like a street gang, and the weapon was music. And the band rehearsed every day. And then we could go and get in free at, at the Fillmore. So we'd go to the Fillmore every night after rehearsal and check out everything there. And But we did gigs with Sly, and it was always intense. Always intense. Did you see Zeppelin at that 69 Fillmore? No, I, no, I did not. Did you ever see Zeppelin? No, 
I never did. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I never did. I did see the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page wow. um, at the Fillmore. Uh, I saw Kareem at the Fillmore. Um, no, I just met Jimmy Page last year for the first time. He he was very kind. Told told, told me Bonzo was a big fan of mine. Wow, where'd you meet Jimmy at? I met him at um, an event they had up here in Seattle. Paul Allen had that Hendrix Museum up here. It's called yeah. Mopop now. Um, and they were doing, and they every year they'd honor somebody. And um, that year they were honoring Jimmy, and then they'd bring in musicians from all over to play and stuff like that. I wasn't playing, but I live in Seattle, so I go. But I, he did come to a show I did in... 1976 in London with Steve Winwood and Stormy Amashta, a project called Go. And Al Demiola was on it and Pat Thrall from Automatic Man. So I know that Jimmy had come to that, but I didn't meet him at that time. That film, or I've done it quite a few times, and uh, it, it's one of the most magic rooms, I think, absolutely hands down in, in America. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was the Mecca, man. I mean, that was just, that was, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in Redwood City. And so just watching from a distance um, what was going on as an aspiring drummer, um, you know, you couldn't, you, I mean, you couldn't avoid the Beatles, but if you're in the Bay Area, you couldn't avoid, you know, Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, Janet, Big Brother, Quicksilver, you couldn't avoid that stuff. It was just a vibe, and um, I remember watching, going to a park in Palo Alto on El Camino and seeing Santana and Jefferson Airplane, and I was looking at, like, Jack Cassidy, or, and I'm like, how the hell do you get to be like that? How do you get to be that cool? You know, how do you... Uh... And, you know, before I played with Santana... Jefferson Airplane had approached me and, and I was jamming with them up at their place on Fulton Street. And then I flew down to LA with Yorma and Jack. And this is way before Santana. Um, and I don't know how they heard about me, but they did. And, and they brought me down there just to observe while they were doing a record. And I mean, it was so, I think we were, what was that place? Tropicana uh, Hotel? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm there staying with Yorma and Jack and Jim Morrison drops by. Um, Eric Clapton comes by with a cassette of a group that he's really excited about called The Band. Oh, you know, I know. <laughs> um, and then uh, I go to the studio and David Crosby comes, uh, bring a song called Triad because the birds didn't want to do it. It was too racy. Um, and I felt like, you know, Forrest Gump, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. That, <laughs> that time is just unbelievable. You know, it, the music out of that era is, is mind boggling, you know, and especially just to think about a little pocket, like hate Ashbury, you know, that street of just yeah. like walking down the street, you know, and, and the hate yeah. street fair and, and like the dead playing to like a million people on hate street or, or you guys playing the mission street festival and that stuff. It's, it's wild, man. Yeah. And the thing about the film war, which people, unless you kind of were familiar with it, that was so unusual and beautiful was the way Bill Graham, you know, would have Charles Lloyd with BB King with Ross on Roland Kirk, you know, with cream with, you know, it was, uh, People got turned on to a lot of different music just by showing up. Well, I often say that I am the human I am because of Bill Graham. I think he's uh, one of the greatest humans ever to walk the earth as far as nurturing talent and gathering music of all, you know, you got Miles Davis, Zeppelin and Cheech and Chong on a bill, you know, right, right. and it was just incredible that, you know, he didn't box anybody in. It was like, hey, man, if it's good, I don't care what it is. Country, uh, jazz, uh, psychedelic, 
I want you kids to zap all of this into your brain and, you know, explore full art. And even up until he died, he was doing that with those day in the greens, you know, just bringing all these giant bands together and letting people see different music, you know? Yeah, absolutely. He's the reason I'll listen to Prince and then ACDC and then Santana <clears throat> and then uh, Miles Davis, you know, That's and right. then Devo. It, the guy, the guy was, I mean, he was amazing, man. Yeah, yeah. Now, he was your manager, right? Yeah, I mean, we had a manager, but he took a extra. He took an interest in us, um, and he was a big fan of Latin music as well, uh, like New York salsa. Um, he's the one that brought us um, Oya Como Va. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, and suggested we do it. So, yeah, he took a big, he 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 managed us, you know, there were uh, different levels of, we had a day-to-day -day guy, and then, because Bill was doing everything else, but he he definitely, uh, like, he got us on Woodstock, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, this is a, a question I've always wondered. So, you're in Santana many years, and then Neil and, of course, um, Greg split to start Journey. Were you asked to ever do that before Ansley Dunn's bar, or what was going on there? No, I, I'm, I'm part of the reason they started Journey, because Carlos and I were doing a record called Caravan Sarai, and um, those guys hated it. <laughs> <laughs> So now about a year ago, I realized, man, I, I, I helped start journey. You know? <laughs> they should induct you on the journey, rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, also. Really. Give me a piece of that shit. <laughs> um, but, uh, but there was a roadie that we had that was like the roadie extraordinaire. His name was Herbie Herbert. Oh yeah, I know. I knew him. Yeah. So Herbie one hated what we were doing, what Carlos and I were doing. I mean, Clive Davis told us we're committing career suicide, you know, so um, so they left. Um, they didn't like the jazz direction. And, um, and to Carlos and I, this is where the excitement was happening in music. I mean, there was rock and roll, but now there, there was like Miles and Bitches Brew and Weather Report and, and Mahavishnu and Return to Fred. It was like getting exciting. Um, and rock seemed stale, and the lifestyle seemed stale. You know, people were dying left and right. And and um, so Herbie, I mean, Greg, I was with Greg when we both saw Neil for the first time together at the Poppycock in, uh, in Palo Alto, the Avenue. But it was very audacious of Greg to ask Carlos, like, we, let's ha have a well it wasn't carlos's band at that time it was a band and neil neil i mean um, greg and carlos kind of started it so um so um for him to ask like let's put in another guitar player you know i always thought that was pretty lot big of carlos to say yeah but greg was into you know the the british rock right he was in the Clapton type of thing and never thought Carlos like got that, you know, which sounds really uh, audacious and it is. Um, but so, yeah, there was a, there was one night when um, Neil sat in with Eric Clapton at the Berkeley community theater when he was playing the Layla tour and Eric asked him to join the band. And we, we had asked him to join the band too. And so you imagine going back to high school the next day, like you're a junior or senior in high school and saying, well, let's see, who should I join? Eric Clapton or Santana, you know? God, that's crazy. That story, right? <laughs> that's really, really something. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, when journey started, it started because they were, not happy with the direction Santana was going. And was there tension? Because I know later I'm going to get into this. Uh, you end up playing in HSAS, but was there tension at that time? Yeah, there was, there was tension. Um, 
I mean, like Herbie Herbert was just like, what the hell are you guys doing? I mean, the whole world loves you. Why Why would you want to do what you're doing? Um, and there was tension. There was also drugs, you know? And so being young with money and drugs and no real guidance, there's going to be tension after a while, um, especially when there's a drug like cocaine. That's a nasty one, right? So, yeah, you know that and heroin it's going to mess up any situation and so um you know we we succumbed to all those things that were were happening at the time you really didn't think twice about it so there was tension anyway right let me ask you you know a lot of the santana of course well-known hits were covers i mean how were you making money at the time I played music for years i understand you know uh it's songwriter gets the the royalties and stuff so how are you making money is it strictly live at the time well there were i mean we had hits but the hits sold the whole albums as well and so the albums did very well i mean um you're right. I think that people don't realize how many covers there were. I brought to Greg's attention, black magic woman. I brought that tune to him and said, man, I think you would sound good singing this. Um, and you know, Jingo, uh, Oyakumo Vaha, Evil Ways. These are all cover tunes. Yeah. And uh, so the, the writers, of course they made, a ton of money but the album sales and you know and the songs that we wrote together were um were also making money so it's not like today where you can't make any money only on the road it's insane yeah it's not, it wasn't like that i mean you were you were getting money from the record labels and how was that split? Was that split? Because usually a drummer gets clowned, you know, because they're like, well, you're the drummer, you didn't write anything. But was it split <laughs> equally? Well, not really. Um, but I'll tell you what we did do that was really wise is that we split the publishing equally. Oh, wow. Because somebody would bring in a tune, but this is a band that like really put the shit together, you know, and, and arranged it and did you know that kind of that kind of thing during covid um i started a thing with the drummer lenny white you know who from return to forever and miles davis um and then mike clark who from herbie hancock and we just started talking twice a week at least twice a week and then we brought in david garibaldi from tower power oh, yeah. and and gregorico from sly and we would just talk during covid like like it was like guys therapy um and also you know we're getting like lenny how's your shoulder you know fine how's your arthritis you know and, and it was just really really enjoyed it and then we started bringing in people to, to interview and and so we've got a ton of people then we brought in a producer later now we have a a show that's really uh, well produced and and you got to check it out it's called stick people it's oh called, absolutely it's on youtube yeah on the corner uh, with stick people and man our list of people that we've interviewed is mostly in the in the jazz vein of course but um uh but it, it's really good you got to check it out i've had so many drummers on because uh you know, I was a singer, a songwriter in bands. I saw but... you. I saw you do the ACDC thing, man. Oh yeah, Pretty, dude, that's some shit. I mean, I mean, that everybody and and uh, and what's his name? Uh, Danny Carey was yeah. playing drums, and was Jason Bonham the other drummer? No, the other one was uh, Tim from Primus. Oh, oh yeah, Tim Alexander. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what a what a night, man! It was basically I sang ACDC with Tool and Primus. It was it was a mind boggler, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I I do that once a year. I do a, a tribute to Bon Scott. I've been doing it for you know over forty years. It started at the Stone at four twelve really? Broadway in San Francisco. Yeah, and it just went forever there. 
but I love in, uh, interviewing drummers because a lot of people don't understand bad drummer. There's never a great band. If you go, this band's phenomenal. There's not a bad drummer in it. There's never been a great band with a bad drummer. It does not happen. You can have a great band with a bad singer or a bad bass player, but bad drummer, you're never going to have a great band. You're absolutely right. And it's the kind of thing where people don't even know why, it, the, you know, they say, I don't know that band I just didn't get, you know, get to me. They don't know. I mean, everything could be right, but if the drums, it's, it's, a, it's an invisible force, you know, that, that keeps it together. But it just doesn't feel good unless the drummer is, it, I mean, is, is really good. But you're absolutely right. I, I feel the same way. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example is uh, ACDC. You look at Phil Rudd and you're like, well, he's not playing nothing. Anybody could do that. And then the next two drummers came in and you're like, this this doesn't feel or sound right at all, you know? Right. It's they, true. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I'm not familiar with, with the, the, the other drummers or anything, but it just in general, it's really true. You know, you just, it's just a whole different ballgame, even if all the parts are correct. 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 Now, you're playing with Santana and then eventually you leave. And at some point this HSAS happens. Now I saw all the shows on this because I was a massive, massive uh, journey and Sammy Hagar fan. So I went to the Marin civic. I saw the San Jose and I saw the, uh, the war field. Really? And, yeah. I went to those man. And uh, they filmed that one for MTV how yeah. does how does this happen? And what a freaky kind of quick moment because you have the hit with the cover, whiter shade of pale, but there's stuff like standing on top, you know, top of the rock and all that. And it was a fierce, fierce fucking rock band, man. Yeah, I mean, I I was um, I had just I was living in New York City and I, you know was talking with Neil on the phone. And you know what are you what are you doing? He said, "Oh, doing you know finishing up this journey record, doing this solo album, and putting something together with Sammy Hagar." You know, I mean, you know, we're just looking for a bass player and a drummer. And he goes, "Oh, Michael, you know, you want to do it?" You know, it's like it's like we're friends, but you don't think, "Oh, Michael's a drummer," you know. And so I said, "Sure." I mean, it was really well put together by by Herbie and his. Herbie Herbert and his company. It was a, a month-long project. Everybody was taken care of very well while being out there. Um, it was interesting for me because I'm not, that's not my thing, you know? Um, and I remember, so I did my best, but I mean, I, I know who I am and who I'm not, and I'm not a rock drummer. Um, and I remember Sammy came out with his book with Joel Selvin later and said, yeah, we had Mike 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 Shreve playing drums. Now Mike's a great rhythmic drummer, but he's not a rock drummer. I think I was drinking some coffee and I practically spit it out. You know, it's like, <laughs> how dare you, motherfucker! And then I, and then I just I had to laugh, and I'm saying he's absolutely right. You know, I mean, I, I was definitely the odd man out on on that thing and did my best to you know, but I'm not that kind of drummer, you know. You know, what's interesting to me, though, is uh, to me, it felt it felt great. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like you had um, some jazz guy playing a five piece kit and rim shots. And, you know, it, it was definitely rocking, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it, there was uh, no lacking at all. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I really it felt good to me. I mean, you, you know. You don't have to be a heavy duty rock drummer to if you really know the essence of what the thing is, you know, like basically less is more. Well, it used to be less is more. It's not anymore. But yeah. um, um, but, you know, to make that groove happen. Right. To, so that it, in the end, the thing is, you just it wants to feel good and the space has to be uh, respected. The space in between the notes or the big sl slow songs, you know. Well, I mean, that's what makes uh, a rock band not a generic rock band. And that's that's yeah. funny that Sammy would say something like that, because I'm the guy, if I'm playing, I recognize somebody plays not your standard cliche rock beats. 
Now you're going to have an interesting band, a Stuart Copeland type of guy where you're, you're back there going like, Hey, this, this band has this, this really cool groove. I have not felt in a rock band in a long time, you know? So that's true. I, I, I would seek a guy, your style playing over any just rock and roll drummer. You know, you can get that anywhere. Yeah. I mean, well, you have guys like, um, I mean, Danny Carey is a perfect example, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he's not your ordinary guy. He's not at all. I mean, even um, what's his name? Um, plays in that band from Chicago. Um, oh, Smashing Pumpkins. Them? No, no, no. Although he, I respect that guy, too. Jimmy Chamberlain. Uh, yeah, Jimmy. Um there's another guy in, in the in the band. What's the guy's Wilco? name? Wilco? Yeah, Wilco. Oh, yeah, that guy's great. And he's unbelievably super creative, the stuff he does on his YouTube channel and stuff. And then he plays in in this in this band, and you know he's gonna offer the right thing plus. Yeah. So. I played with a guy named Ronnie Crawford, and he his big claim to fame was uh, Lisa Loeb. So when he was recommended to me, I was like, Lisa Loeb? I, I don't know, man. I'm not playing coffee shop. I wasn't clowning on her, but I am playing uh, Wilco kind of Americana singer-songwriter music. That's kind of like a, a Stan Lynch petty thing, you know? And this guy came in, and his feel was a, definitely a jazz background and, and also uh, a folk background. And what he added... He could do Bonzo, he could do Keith Moon, and he could do, you know, the Eagles if he wanted to, you know? It was, those guys with the bag of tricks is unreal. Another guy I played with, Ed Berman, who was in the Freaky Executives, you might remember them. This guy, too, because he came from an R&B background. Right. When they play rock, it's just so much better. Right. Uh, I mean, look at all the Motown tunes. Those were all, all jazz players, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, and then, you know, then you have the Nashville players, which is a whole other thing. One of the things with me, what's been good for me growing older is I was such a snob when I was younger that, you know, I was just like looking at, you know, Tony Williams and Elvin Jones and Jack D. you know, okay, I like Mitch Mitchell. I like, you know, Ginger Baker for a while, but I was a snob to all the big rock groups. And so... As I as that lessened in me, and I became more open to hearing it, I then it's like I had my childhood as I grew older that I could see what the vibe of Pink Floyd was, or of course Zeppelin. Listen to that fucking groove, you know. Yeah. Um, and have appreciation for this stuff, and it goes the same way for studio drummers and Nashville drummers, and you know. Um, because they make everything feel good. They just, they have a way of doing it. And now I wish I've gotten called more for those kind of things. You know, nobody calls me for like a backbeat gig. You know, I don't mean a heavy rock thing. I mean, you know, although there is a record that I'm really proud of. I don't know if you've ever heard a singer named Sean Smith. Oh, I've hell seen. yeah. I've, I've, I knew him well, played lots of gigs with him. Rest in peace. One of the greatest, he was the, Prince of Seattle, man. Uh, you know, that record, Brad with Stone Gossard, right. is a masterpiece of songwriting and vibe, man. What a, what a, what a genius that man was. Yeah, he was a very dear friend of mine, too. And he did a solo album that I played on. And I was really happy that somebody asked me to play songs like that because I love them, you know. And I mean, I love I, I love a, a good pop tune, but... um yeah it's, what was it, that like playing with sean oh man it was it was so funny i mean you know sean you know finally got some kind of record deal and um and the way he used the money was very interesting because everything was so relaxed in the studio he just booked out the studio and wasted a lot of time like sitting around in the back room watching um What's that t the show about the TV the TV show about the TV show and the comedian that Oh yeah 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 oh yeah the, the like the Tonight Show spoof um 
type of show where he uh, Larry uh, Sanders show. Or, yeah, yeah, Gary Sanders. Yeah, yeah, Gary Shanling's the guy, but I think it was called Larry Sanders. Okay, yeah. Anyway, he was a big fan of that show, and I I never had seen it. We watched a lot of those. It was like a, just all about being relaxed and then going to the studio and running down a tune or jamming. And he would make up the lyrics on the spot. Wow. And I, I always would get on him like, Sean, this is really a great song. You should work on these lyrics, you know? And he was just like a jazz guy in that way. Um, and so it was a beautiful experience working with him. I mean, he was a dear, he used to stay at my house on the couch all the time and, and uh, we'd hang out a lot. Yeah. I, I he was just, I, I miss that guy so much. He was oh. so, so such a gentle, you know, guy, but what a voice. He had that oh. kind of voice, man that, you know, like a Bobby Womack or a Mavis Staples, you know, that yeah. kind of, where now you have, What's his name um, from Nashville, uh, who's huge with uh, that kind of voice? Chris Stapleton. Uh, yeah, Chris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's it's wild, man. I met Sean. Uh, we did a gig together. He was at the time. Brad didn't tour, so he put together Satchel. And we played yeah. the Paradise Lounge in San Fran. And, he, and I had worshipped this guy because that really? record, I loved what I call soul rock. And yeah. it was always something I wanted to do. I wanted to be rock, but I wanted to have like Terrence Trent Darby vocals. Uh -huh. And here comes this guy and he's basically, he could dance. He's a bigger dude, but he didn't give a fuck. He was like, I'm the dude. And he'd yeah. have like a badass suit and shit. And he watched our set and he came up to me after and he goes, man, you are incredible. And he gave me this satchel. It was a felt satchel with like oils and cards and incense and we became friends from that day on, you know, and later mm. he play, played with Greg Dooley and the Afghan wigs. And this guy, him and Andrew Wood were the Seattle gurus, man, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, when I moved up here, like late 89, I, it, grunge was going on and I thought, well, grunge is done, you know, but it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, I started knowing these guys. It was a whole different, different world. I became, I became good friends with Rick Parishar, who had a studio called London Bridge with his brother. And that's where they recorded Pearl Jam 10. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a whole different scene up here. But Sean was really, really something. Did you ever hear my band Automatic Man? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's it's amazing to look at all of your work because, you know, I'm going through the Wikipedia again and I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot all about this, you know, and then you just start thinking about all the stuff you've done. And it, it's an amazing accomplishment, I think, as this, you know, like you said at the beginning of the interview, fuck, I've done all this shit. They only asked me about Woodstock, you know, but <laughs> that's because we have. You happen to play the most iconic festival of all time. It's equivalent to walking on the moon first, you know, no matter what they did after they're going to be like, Hey, you walked on the moon. You're like, yeah, but I also invented the Ferrari Dino or whatever. And they'd be like, yeah, but you walked on the moon. That's yeah. what Woodstock is. And, you know, and to think about in this political climate these days, you just wish that we could go back to the simplicity of a Woodstock, you know, not the Woodstock 99, of course, but the one you play. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that could ever happen, you know. Now, Genie's out of the bottle. It's not it's not uh, going back in, you know. But Carlos just texted me about like putting together next year, 2025, like Woodstocks start, you know, like Golden Gate Park, Central Park, Hyde Park, all oh. all the world in these parks and inviting people to to do it again like a peace thing wow you know? and with yeah. greg raleigh no 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 i mean carlos's band but um uh and he's talking about all kinds of bands that are, have agreed to it you know uh, just another one i just watched the again is 
or that new um, documentary on Little Steven the other night. Oh, how's that? It's really great. It's really talk about a fascinating career. Oh God, yeah. Or life, you know. Yeah, it, I mean, you know, I just saw Bruce play about two months ago, and uh, I'm 58, and I what are you 72, seven or something? Yeah, I'm about to be 75 in July. Yeah, so I'm thinking, you know. I'm a comedian, so I'm working on this bit right now where I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, I only got like four concerts left in me to go to, you know, because I just, I, I'm there and I'm like, seeing it, seeing it, seeing it. And it's not a bitter thing. It's like, you know, but yeah. I was thinking about, so I go see Bruce. I never miss Bruce. He's fucking one of the greatest songwriters of all time and performers. And I'm thinking, okay, Bruce is in incredible shape. You know, and uh, the rest of the band, they have to play three hours. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people in that age of Bruce and the band guys, they play like 12 songs on tour, like say a Chicago or something, you know. But when, yeah. it, when you're in Bruce's band, you're like, fuck, man, can we cut a couple songs tonight? You know, like 31 songs, three hours, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, it's wild. Know. It is wild, yeah. man. Well, it's uh, getting hard for him too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. And I think that Bruce has that level of uh, ego and pride and, and he doesn't want to let the crowd down where people go, you know, he only played two hours, you yeah. know, <laughs> which is fucking great. Two hours. Yeah. I know it's like the grateful, grateful dead too. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody thought they'd all be dead, not just Jerry. Right. And, uh, I mean, it turns out that, you know, you see Bob Weir, like, doing his, like, exercise videos every day on the yeah. tour, you know, and you're going, yeah, go for it, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about uh, any injuries? Uh, you're talking about shoulders, hands, and hearing and all that. Uh, what do you got? Yeah, I've got arthritis in my hands. Um, I also have AFib, you know, a heart thing. Oh, wow. So my playing situation is completely different. My, my making, the way I make music is now, ever since COVID, I've been training myself on music software, things, things that would enable me to be able to make music if I'm not out there like playing away at the drums. Um, and so it's changed, and, and, but in a lot of ways it's freed me up. And now when I do tracks of create stuff, um, oftentimes the acoustic drums are the last thing to put on. And I do that on purpose. So it's like, okay, now how would the, how would the, the human thing fit into everything else that I've created here? You know, how can I best humanize it with the way I play drums or something? But yeah, I mean, in Seattle, basically the scene is playing these clubs and taverns, you know, for no money. And I did that. I had weekly a weekly gig at several places in the Fremont neighborhood. Um, one called Toast, and um, the other one was a place called Nectar. And I played. I had a band and played every week for years. A couple of different bands, and then off, after a while, I just got tired of it. You know, I just got. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's just same people every week. You know. Um, yep. Although if bands were in town, that sometimes, you know, like Vinny would come down and drummers would come by. And, but, and I thought, I don't know, you know, everybody says, well, at least you're playing music. And I'm like, I don't know. It starts at like 10 or 11 o'clock. And it's like, I don't make it. Money. I got to pay somebody to take my drums, you know, I don't, cause I don't want to set up the fucking drums. I just, you know, it's not, I don't, the thrill is gone, you know? So, so I, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to stay super creative and I'm also trying to be whatever it is that I, I want to be, What you know, not what people expect of me or this, that. That's become really important in the way I'm making music and the music that I'm making as well. It's like, I, you know, just like be yourself and be it hard. Yeah, it's it's funny that you say the thrill is gone and somebody may listen to that and go, Oh, well, that's just sad. 
And I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, well, let me put this in perspective, because I played music for 25 years and stopped and then became a comedian. But people always say, well, well, well how, how did why did you stop playing music? I mean, you know, and it's like, have you ever done anything for five years? And they're like, no. And I'm like, you ever done anything for 10 years? No. You ever done anything for three years? Because then until you do something most of your life, you're not going to understand there's other things people might want to try in life or, you know, they burn out on something, which is totally natural, you know? Now, yeah. if Santana said, hey, come play, and you just played, like you said, the five giantest gigs, and you flew in, and the kit's there, and, and the audience isn't, you know, 20 people that you saw every week talking to you about Woodstock, then the fire gets fucking cooking again, you know? But when you've cooked it at a level that you have, you're like, I've been there, man. You know? Yeah, I mean, when I'm saying the thrill is gone, really the thrill is gone. I was talking about playing in the clubs starting at 1030 at night. Right. You know, to the same people. Um, but even the thrill is gone, like, like Carlos and I talk all the time or text all the time. But, you know, I didn't join him at Woodstock 50th anniversary, you know? And everybody's like, just like you were saying, how could you not you know, and Carlos too, you know, and I was like, don't you get it? I mean, don't you, I mean, there's nothing anybody would be, be say that would be kind about me, you know? I mean, I don't look like I used to, I don't play like I used to, the thrill of it at that time was the time and how young I was, how young the band was, how amazing the drum solo was. You're just not going to beat it, you know? And some things are just best left alone, you know? Just yeah. leave, just walk, you know, walk away from it. So, well, right. I, will, I didn't I will, do it either. I will tell you this. You've got a new record out, and um, Drums of Compassion came out May 24th, everybody. Uh, dig into this. This could be my new, you know, my brain gets pretty rab rattled because I started comedy really late and um, I'm grinding like a, a 23 year old every night out and everything. And it is uh, exhausting, but also exhilarating. And uh, this record could be my new, I need to chill tonight record. It is perfect. Perf it's spa rock. I've named it spa rock it's it's it, it's like i'm in Toto santos i'm looking at the beach i'm eating a fresh fish taco and just this beautiful calming music comes on and that i need a lot in life man and this is a great record i tell you dean that's the perfect way to describe it except i don't know about the spa rock but the reason i i the premise of starting this record was when I moved to Seattle and I had a, a you know young family that they'd go to sleep and I would get go back out. I'd go into the clubs, you know, and head out and see what's happening. Go see Reggie Watts over at this place or do you know all kinds of you know avant garde stuff, bands. And I'd come home at two in the morning, you know, two thirty, and I'd listen to some music, but I want to chill. So I wouldn't be listening to, you know, rock and roll or even even anything that like I didn't even want to groove. I wanted like choral music or something. And then it occurred to me, what kind of music as a drummer could I make that I would want to listen to right now? And that was the whole premise of the record. Like as a drummer, what kind of music could somebody put on at two in the morning? Perfect example of what you're talking about, you know. So that means mission accomplished. Oh, God, yeah. As soon as I put it on, I was like, oh, man, this is, you know, sometimes I, I have some weird uh, noise in my bathroom. I don't, nobody can figure out what it is. It's just like, ooh. And <laughs> people look at me like I'm crazy, like, I can barely even hear that. I go, yeah, well, you're not laying in my bed at 3 a.m., you know, where you yep. just got home. 
So this would be something I'd put on and just calm me and my dog and just lay there and be like, this is beautiful, man. And I, yeah, I listened to it all last night and this morning. I was like, this is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I have some of the greatest percussionist drummers on the world in the world on this Jack D. Jeanette, Zakir Hussein, um, Ayrton Moriera, you know, um, so many and, and, Pete Lockett and a drummer, a percussionist I found on Instagram, a, a fellow named Stefan Moss from Germany. So cool. You find these people on Instagram and you just reach out and say, hey, put some tracks on this thing, you know, and it's uh, it's, ver it's very, it, it, this album is real culmination of a lot of stuff about me. And so um, I'm really happy that you feel that way about it. Yeah, it's funny you talk about Instagram because I hate all social media except for Instagram because uh, I also do a podcast where I interview people that are artisans that make stuff like uh, drum kits or guitars or home stereos or choppers or boots. And it's such a beautiful, you know, platform of sliding around going like, well, wow, look at this guy. He's over in like South Africa and he made this like weird motorcycle out of wood something like that you know and yeah. uh and like yeah. you said finding players it is uh and, and with the state of the art of just sending over stems and everything it's yeah. it's a whole different world and it's great for someone like you that doesn't want to go out of the clubs at midnight anymore because you can still be creative in your house you know i yeah. mean this yeah. this record's very creative it's so outside the box you know, it's it's nothing what I thought it was going to be. I know some people have posted online like one guy said, I mean, mostly the, the reviews have been more than I can ask for. People are genuinely moved by it. Yeah. You know, rather than just say, oh, it's a cool drum record or, you know, like Neil Schoen said, trippy. You know, it's like, no, dude, it's not fucking trippy. It's deep and beautiful, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Neil's a friend, but I just say, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, half my friends don't like this. I mean, Greg wouldn't even bother to listen to this shit, you know. I mean, even my stuff that's got backbeats and uh, I don't really, your stuff's so esoteric, you know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it is what it is. But what's my point here? Yeah, the the reviews have been super positive. People have been saying like deep things that really moved me. But there's one guy that said, I got this record a month ago and it's awful. It's just terrible, you know? And it may it makes me laugh because I don't care anymore, right? So um so I reached out to him online and I said, Well, what were you expecting? He said, you know, like Santana 4 or the stuff you used to do with Carlitos. And I'm saying, well, that's your problem. You know, you're listening to it, expecting it to be something else. My job is to do what I want to do, not what you want me to do. And my job is to move forward. And um, and we ha kind of had a dialogue for a little bit. And yeah. yeah. Man, I come up with comedy bits all the time. I should try them out on you sometime. Like... <laughs> Just, you know, I mean, are you going to do a bit about older people going to concerts? Like when I oh, last I went to a Journey concert, that was like everybody like in their 60s and they're and, and they're like lovebirds. And I know it's sweet, but it's like, you know, yeah, my I, mind is a little sick and I go, oh, you know, gag me with a spoon type of thing. You know? Yeah, I, I'm working on a bit right now where. It's basically like, hey, people, stop falling for the farewell tour. You know, there's no fucking farewell. Everyone's dead in Skinnerd, and they're out touring <laughs> this year. The name is touring. The name, you know, and, and, you know, Foreigner, not one original member in the band. And I saw Foreigner and the, this lady, she looked at me and she goes, wow, he still sounds amazing. And I'm like, that's not even the original guy. And she goes, I don't give a fuck. And I was just furious. I, I fucking <laughs> left. I was like, what the fuck? I couldn't believe she, she said that. I don't give a fuck. 
I was like, oh man, go for, for $10, you can go see a foreigner cover band and, and you don't have to pay a hundred dollars for parking and you, you don't, you know, have to pay 75 to a hundred for a ticket and $30 for a beer. You can go down to some shitty little bar and see like, um, you know, urgent, the foreigner cover band, and it's going to be probably better and way yeah. cheaper. Yeah, yeah, you know, you have a good point. It's the material that they love. I mean, that's it. You know, I mean, look at Journey. A lot of people still say Journey will never be the same without Steve Perry. You know, but Steve Perry can't do it, and uh, and most people that do do Journey as a singer, they're burned out within a year. That material is impossible. You 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 know. Yeah, oh, but the but the Infinity record is so mind boggling to me. It could be the greatest vocals ever put down on vinyl between Greg and him. It's it's nuts. Yeah. I mean, he does an incredible job that, you know. Oh, Arnell I mean, kills it. Yeah. It's just, I mean, they're bigger than ever. Yeah. They're, they're out doing stadiums every year with, you know, different tours, Def Leppard this year. And, uh, yeah. but when the band has no original members, I have a problem with it. Yeah, but it's not. It doesn't fucking matter to me because the problem is solved by not going. I don't yeah. sit there and go. Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not some Clint Eastwood. Get off my lawn. I just go see another band that I think's fantastic and newer, like a Marcus King or a Rival Sons or a Chris Stapleton, and and that other stuff's not even in my fucking train of thought because. I don't live off of 20 songs as my memory. Most people, when they say there's no good music, it's because they're only living on the memories when they didn't have a divorce and bills and, and they're getting blown in the back of a car. That's all that means to them. It doesn't mean there's no good music. They just stopped looking. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I find that to be true with most of my peers um, that, I keep asking myself, you know, when are you going to make time for yourself to just listen to music, even not in the environment where you make music, because that's what you grew up with, like just the pleasure and joy of finding new music and listening to it. So I try to do that quite often, like four or five in the morning if I'm up, for instance, right? And I'll go on band camp and I'll just like look around and explore and there's so much good stuff out there for any genre that you want. And, you know, to me, that's exciting. Oh, it's, there's two, uh, there's two records out that came out in the last two weeks. One of them, Chicano Batman, they just played Seattle. You would love these guys, man. I, 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 I saw, I saw the interview and I checked them out online on YouTube. Great, great. <laughs> just soul music, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Every week I get records and I'm like, this band King Hannah blowing my mind right now with this new record. If you're into Mazzy Star, you're going to love this. You know, me, it's Neil yeah. Young. There's so much good shit out there. I can barely keep up, man. And, and, uh, but I yeah. love, I love it. It's a constant, like when I was a kid going to the record store, yeah. oh, look at this, man. Yeah. After the gold rush or Zuma, you know, and then going yeah. back ACDC, let there be rock, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny, man. When my kids were growing up, they went to a summer camp on one of the islands out here. And, you know, I'm, you, you know, it's good for the kids. Although my youngest one was felt just like me about it. Like he didn't want to join the kids groups or anything. And I didn't want to join the parents groups. You know, where you, okay, badminton or volleyball, and you're, you know, super competitive and this, that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, so what I did was I created a course at the camp called New Music for Grown Ups. And I put together playlists, like, and I, my, I told them there's always good. I know you, the soundtrack to your life is maybe Tom Petty yeah. or, you know, or the soundtrack to your life is, you know, this group. Um, but let me provide you with some current alternatives. You know, like if you like this vocal group, you know, try Fleet Foxes. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you like Jackson Brown, 
try this singer. So if you like a little bit of like evocative international, try this singer, Suzanne Baca from Peru, you know, and people loved it because yeah. they were like, geez, and I'd make a playlist and, um, and let them go home with it, you know, and that way I got out of, uh, that way I got out of volleyball practice. <laughs> well, I, I provide a platform on the podcast of new music all the time. And the amount of DMS and emails I get all the time, like, Oh my God, uh, thank you. I just, I got the kids and I just, I just don't have time, but Oh, this stuff is amazing. And I love doing that because your brain starts to work again when it gets inspired by art. You're like, oh, oh God, you're not in the same old rut of drop the kids off at school, then go to work, then pay bills. And then you start going, oh, okay. And music has been our boat through life. It's sailed us through the seas, you know? Yeah. I've taken a really, in the last couple of years, taking an interest in um, AI art and um, I've got so into it. It's, if I don't, if I'm not looking for new music at 4 a.m., I'm, I'm trying to create new AI art and I'm just fascinated by it as much as I used to be like, you know, with the Ludwig drum catalog under the covers at night, you know, it's like, yeah. I love this. And I've been doing it now for a couple of years and um, people hate it when I, when I, People feel like about AI, it's like Trump and, and and Biden or something, you know, it's like, man, they get so offended. But so now I just, I just tell them, well, I don't talk about it. Let's put it that way. I just yeah. do it. <laughs> on my band camp, a lot of my album covers I did myself, you know, and I'm making compilations of my solo albums and putting them out uh, thematically, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of good stuff that you've done that ha you ha hasn't been out. Probably just like material for a comic, you know, where an idea you had years ago, like now you figure out a way to make put it in a put it in a situation in a skit or whatever. You, what do you call them? A bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's true because there's stuff that I have like from eight years ago. And then stuff happens in my life and I go, oh, that's going to fit right into here. And, you know, they just stay in your backpack of jokes yeah. and you start piecing it together like, oh, man, I had this thing way back then. Right now I'm doing a whole motorcycle chunk and I had an old motorcycle chunk and I moved it into the new motorcycle chunk. And now it's this new seven minutes and it's fucking smashing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing that with music, too. Where even on some a piece on uh, drums compassion, where it's two different pieces brought together, you know, yeah. Percussion I recorded in Milan with the Santana guys, and then, and then found another piece of music and put it on top. You know, it's it's there's there's really no rules, you know. But I think that the trick is to make yourself laugh, right? You yeah. got to make yourself laugh. Totally, totally, and, yeah. Same when with you, music, yeah. When you've done comedy so long. It's hard to laugh, you know, because you're like, people will go, yeah, I got a good joke for you. And it's always these shit dad jokes, you know, and they look at me and I'm like, do you understand? Nightly, I'm around the greatest comedians of all time. Do you understand that? Like, uh -huh. you know, we're not at the work site here on our 15 minute break at the lunch truck. I'm out at the highest level with yeah. with some of the masters you know yeah. at the comedy store a bill burr uh yeah. a, a marin a ali wong a sebastian maliscalco uh you know these guys that you're just going hey man you're not going to be able to get me to laugh you know <laughs> that's why when i'm in an uber and they go what do you do i go construction and they don't say one fucking thing <laughs> right right you don't have to tell a joke yeah right uh, let me let me ask you real some drum nerd shit. You're playing Ludwig uh, younger. At what point do you get into DW? Because they, I think right around, I would say late eighties, they explode onto the scene. Them and Ayot were like the new drum people, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I, Ludwig, I started out with that 
kit I played at Woodstock is a my first drum kit. I bought it while I was on the road after high school. I didn't have a drum kit like all through high school. I was always borrowing drums and this, that, and the other. And so I had that kit for years. Then I had another wooden um, Ludwig kit that was really very nice. Um, I ended up selling that kit to somebody, the Woodstock kit, and later remembered where it was reminded of where it went. And I reached out to the guy and said, well, you know, any chance I could buy that back from you? And he was, thank God, he was like, oh, man, sure. Just give me enough for a, a used drum set, you know? Wow. So 600 bucks, I got the kit back. And I'm like, you know, go get it now before he changes his mind. And, uh -huh. um, and then, of course, I went to Gretsch for a while because all the jazz guys. Yep. And then I, at Camco. And Camco, you you know, DW was born out of Camco. Right. Um, so I had a good friend named um uh what's his name? Scott, who is with um drum workshop. Man, this is ridiculous. I'm, just, I'm forgetting his name. It's John Good and Scott Garrison. Okay. And Scott was a good friend in the Bay Area in Marin County. And used to do some stuff for me. He used to be Tony Williams' uh, roadie guy. Oh, and wow. when I moved to Seattle, he drove up with me. And and then he got with um, Drum Workshop. And I guess at a NAMM show or something, I, I started seeing him. I went to the company, and John Good and I had known each other as well. The drums they were making were just so gorgeous. Amazing. And, yeah, just so beautiful. It sounded great. So, um, and they've always been really, really good to me, too. Uh, Ayot, though, I lusted for Ayot, being up here in the Pacific Northwest and then being in Vancouver. Right. I did go up to the shop. I did get an Ayot kit. I ended up selling it. It was beautiful. All wood hoops. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you know... Um, the guy in Soundgarden was playing him, <clears throat> and that's when I first saw it. And I was like, "What's this Ayot?" You know, and it was like, "Oh, it's better because it's got wood hoops, so that it resonates better and everything." Uh, I had seen the guy about six years ago, the old man, and he was at Nam show, just standing there by himself with an Ayot kit. And I was like, "Oh fuck, there he is! He's still around." And I, yeah. I kind of felt sad because. I was like, this guy makes some of the best drums, you know? Yeah. And it, it just kind of like he was standing there like, hey, and I talked to him for a while, but those drums are fa fantastic, man. Yeah, they really are. There's a bunch of small companies that are making beautiful stuff now. Yeah, like like guitars and amps. You get these boutique companies, and they just go the, the extra mile, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you I still have the Woodstock kit? No, I did sell it uh, at auction about – Two or four years ago, it now lives in the in Nashville in the uh, Pop Museum there, which is I haven't been there, but I've seen the display and stuff, and it's it's very nice. I've, it's you know I got to get out there, but yeah. Let's talk a little comedy before we get out of here. Uh, you watch comedy? You are you up on it? Uh, I don't know if I'm up on it all the way, but but. We definitely binge on comedy when uh, it's like okay, time to time to go to Netflix or Comedy Central and uh, and check out what's happening and see, you know. I, but we watch we watch a lot of it. We just went through a whole big Bill Burr thing. It was like, you know, like everything type of stuff. You know, <laughs> he plays drums. You know, he does. Yeah, he plays drums in my ACDC thing. You can uh, watch it. Bill Burr, Dean Del Rey, it'll come up on YouTube. And uh, he travels with the drum kit uh, while we're on tour. And he plays backstage just to kind of uh, keep his chops up because he doesn't get a lot of time to play at home. And <laughs> this this week, we were just in um, San Jose, and my buddy Paul brought down a, a Ludwig Champagne Sparkle 
and he just fell in love with it. It sounded incredible. A newer Ludwig that was just phenomenal. But Bill has a, a sonar kit, and he did have the green uh, Bonzo Vis uh, Ludwig uh, Sparkle. Uh -huh. and he had an exact one of that, but he sold that because he was like, what am I doing? I'm not Bonzo, you know? So yeah. he loves drums, and, um, you know, he – so once a year when we do the Bon Scott thing, he comes down and plays and it's it's just a thrill, you know? Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. We got to get you at that uh, Moore Theater and see it live. When, when is it? It's uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. I got to get it together. I don't go out anymore. It's like, yeah. you know. I know. That's, I, a, that's a bit that I, I was thinking you could do about like, I mean... I was admiring the fact that you at least went out now and checked out music. I don't even do that anymore. I don't even go see my friends play. You know, I do. Okay. Every once in a while. I mean, I, I, I went to, I'll go to a place where I know I, it's manageable, like a jazz alley or something like that. And, yeah. Um, but I can't go to the big concerts. I have no desire. I just don't, you know, everything about it is undesirable to me. Like, I mean, definitely I'd take an Uber because who wants to park and, no, you know, no. and then just walking like to, you know, um, I didn't yeah. even go to the Stones this last time. You know, I did see them the last time with, with Charlie. Yeah. It's just all too much. You know, it's just all too much. Well, dude, I'm 58 and I'm done. I'm like, if I wasn't doing comedy, I love being home with my dog and I love walking around the neighborhood, man, because <laughs> I've fucking had the throttle floored for 45 years. Yeah. People are just like, oh, you're just getting old. It's like, no, nah, man, I'm doing something that I've never gotten to do. And that's chill. It's the new drug for me. Yeah. You've yeah. been chilling for 20 or 10 years. I've seen everyone. I've been all over. And, uh, you know, I enjoy chilling. <laughs> yeah i mean i mean i mean comedy is a tough tough gig i mean the hardest the hardest yeah i would think a comedy and like broadway dancers yeah. something like that. i always thought I, I lived in midtown for 10 years yeah uh stop me a dancer you know comedy yeah i mean i i, I watched reggie watts develop up here you Great. know his whole thing. And um, he's even on a record that I have out called Trilon um, before he did the comedy thing. But I, he started working it up like in between sets uh, with uh, Moktub, his band Moktub. Right. Yeah. Before we get out of here, do you remember where you were when Bill Graham died? Um, where was I? I'm trying to think. What year was it? Man, good question. Maybe uh, maybe nineties or something. You know, uh, I mean, early nineties. I think I was up here in Seattle then, and I heard about it, and I heard how it happened, and I really it pissed me off because I know the pilot of that helicopter, and I know I've been on planes with him where I didn't think we should be flying. Yeah, you know, and um. You know, it's just such a waste, such a waste. Brutal, brutal. Yeah, yeah. But God bless that man. He he changed my world. Yeah, he did. He changed my world, too. He's changed more people's world than people even know. I mean, think yeah. about the average concert goer for 25 years in the Bay Area. They have no idea the heart and soul that was put in behind the scenes to make sure that that fan had a, the best time they could, whether yeah. it be sound, lighting, venues, food, uh, you know, uh, medical help. If you OD'd anything, this guy, he is the grand poobah of concert promoters. No one comes close. Did you see last days at the Fillmore? The Did movie? I see? No. What's that? 
Oh man, it's on YouTube. It's a documentary called "Last Days of the Fillmore." Oh no, I gotta, I gotta watch that oh, immediately. Definitely, guy. It's like Bill at his best too oh. on the phone, and uh, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm on that. I'm on that tonight. Yeah, yeah. So you know, why don't you send me a list of uh, comedians I should check out, man? I'm gonna send that over to you, and um, you know, I gotta thank you once again. Everybody, it's called Drums of Compassion. It's on uh, all streaming platforms. It's on YouTube. And um, it came out May 24th. Dig into this record, man. When you're, you know, in this political climate, you could really use something that'll just ease your brain. And this is going to be the record for that. And also, do yourself a favor and go watch Woodstock. I watch it probably once every three or four months. I just throw it on. Uh, the Santana performance. And also you can stream that record. It's out on uh, streaming platforms and it is. So, let it me is make a recommendation. Yep. If, if you like Woodstock, there's Santana at Tanglewood one year later, and that's superior. Wow. Is that uh streaming? It's on, it's on YouTube. Oh, I'm on that immediately. Wow. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's a better solo. The band was on fire yeah. because we were opening for Miles Davis. And so it was like, oh, boy. And we were, you know, to me, that was even better performance. Wow. OK, uh, I'm I'm all over that. And long live Baron Woolman and the great Bill Graham. And uh, okay. thank you so much for doing the show. Very welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you, man. You too, man. I really appreciate it. And when I come to Seattle, I'm going to drag you out of the house. Okay. <laughs> All right, buddy. See ya. Later.